that shows the practices of the farmer, when they are more species appropriate, the animal is healthier and you have a much healthier product in the end. This is the reason that I struggle with chickens right. <laughs> and, and eggs. And I know that on your farm that you had in Texas, you were doing it very intentionally, but that type of chicken and egg is so hard for me to get. Even here in Costa Rica, people always ask, do you eat eggs? Yes, I eat eggs. It's so hard for me to get a chicken that's raised the way it's supposed to be raised, quote unquote, mm. uh, a chicken that's actually foraging. And you know, interestingly, I talked to one of the farmers here at the farmer's market. And one of the things I love about being in Costa Rica is they're, they're legit farmers that are up in the mountains outside of where I live. And he has two types of chickens. One of them is called caseros and they are a chicken that handles the heat better. So they get out of the chicken coop more often and they're basically outside all the time. So that egg is going to be much more like what I want to eat than a chicken that just stays in an enclosure, even though it's outdoors and is mostly eating grains. I want mm. the chicken to really graze and eat the bugs that it's supposed to eat. This is why I really appreciate ruminants. And by ruminants, I mostly mean cows, but sheep, lamb, uh, goats, bison. These are all ruminants, also deer. These animals can be, you know, more scalably produced in a way where they eat grass from start to finish, and then they're on rotational grazing. That's a, that's a very high quality animal. Yeah. And not to be, not to be um, uh, you know, uh, like overly uh, appreciative of cows, but I think that if you took a grass-fed cow, for me, a grass-fed, grass-finished, especially regeneratively raised cow, that is a, a very uniquely nutritious and well-raised animal versus even the best chickens that you're gonna get out there right now. I just, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very cow biased. I've put out a request to figure out if there is one commercially produced pork or chicken, like something you could buy at a grocery store, for example, that is species appropriate. Right. And I have not found one example. I know of three pork producers. I've probably talked to over a hundred farmers. This is why I went with pork and chicken because I was doing a bunch of tests at my farm to figure out different breeds, different feed sources, can we get them sort of transitioned away from commercial feeding operations? Even the term pasture raised chicken oh, yeah. and pork, I think is ridiculous, even if it was done at the best thing, because these animals in their genetics are not pasture raised animals. They shouldn't be out in the wild on grasslands. Cattle should be, because they're descendants of, right. of different types of species, like a bison who should roam grasslands grass and in herds. Right. Whereas chickens, are jungle fowl. They should be up in the trees here in Costa Rica, eating weird things that grow in jungles. And then we took them trees, out. Trees, yeah. Yeah, we, we took them out because they're, they're, they're prey animals. So they should be up in trees away from things that could eat them. And this is why if you have turkeys in the wild, even will go up in trees, in forests, they will not be in pastures because eagles can come and eat them, you know, whatever sort of predator. Pigs, forest dwellers. They are not pasture raised animals. Right, right. And if you put them in a pasture, they actually ruin the pasture because they root. Their species of appropriate behavior is rooting, which is great for a forest floor because it turns over the leaves that fall down, it mixes in with the soil. That's great for the ecosystem. Yeah. But a, what a lot of pasture raised pork producers will do is they'll put rings in their noses so they don't root the pasture up. So yeah. that way they can market them as pasture raised animals. This is where they, this is how they get their food. This is what, this is what they should be doing. Yes. And, and so even when you look at pasture raised, and I don't wanna, like there's a lot of farmers who are trying to do good stuff and I don't mean to say like that is worse, for example, than anything you would get in the package. It's still a much better food. Like there's, I think, spectrums to all this type of stuff. Like pasture raised is for sure better than cage free, free range, et cetera. And commercial pork that's on a concrete slab that has nothing to root. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, like we, we we have this class of animals that we're actually eating more of as red meats being demonized, saturated fats being demonized. I got, I had eight pigs. It was eight tons of feed to raise out eight pigs. What? I got the truckload of the feed to raise these eight, eight pigs. My fucking mind was blown, man. I was like, it was on a semi truck, like bed, bed truck. I had, it like took me about three hours to get my tractor for each pallet, eight of them. I put the forklift in, I went back, and my tractor went like this and slammed down because of how heavy they were. And that was just to raise eight pigs. That's it. That's crazy. And, and these were like the, the best, I, I sprouted the grain, I had two separate groups, we can talk about some of the findings if you're interested in that. 
but they were in, like we had just cleared out some underbrush of yopon, which grows a lot in the forest in Texas and put them in there to clear it up and dig up the roots. So they had access to root like they should. But seeing the, the amount of food I had to give them daily that was not inherent in the environment, mind blowing. And if I would have let them go in the same amount of space, they would have died. They would have been in the food. Because like a wild hog has hundreds of acres of access. You can't put a pig in, in somewhere and have it exhibit a species appropriate behavior on an actual farm, as far as I'm concerned. It's very it's hard. hard. Yeah. And so people ask me a lot, eggs, chicken, pork, and this is a more eloquent answer that you've given than, than I've typically responded with, but the idea is, yeah, it's, it's hard. It's just harder to get yeah. these, these foods in a species appropriate diet, in a species appropriate way. And this is one of the things that I think is so great about cattle and ruminants is that they're meant to be on grasslands yeah. and it's why I like eating them because there are scalable operations in place. I mean, we can talk about it when we talk about lineage. I went to Australia and saw some of the farming by Melbourne in Victoria and it was the best farming I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. I, I, I literally went to farms that were on the ocean. I mean, it's like in the United States, this or anywhere else in the world, this, uh, this type of land would be condos and high rise hotels. But for some reason in the south of Victoria, in Australia, it's a freaking farm. And the farm like backs up to the ocean. And so you're, you're, you're feeling the ocean breeze. The grass is super green uh, and the cows are just there with the cows have like the, this million dollar view to the ocean mm. uh, south to Tasmania in Australia. And there's so much amazing farming there that can happen for these ruminants because grasslands and cattle just, it makes so much sense. What's really interesting that I would like to see some research on is how mineral deficient, even cattle that are raised on continuously grazed pastures, the, if the fields have ever been farmed before, monocrops have effectively pulled all the minerals yeah. out of the soil. So even if you restore the pasture, a lot of times you don't get mineral release from the rocks in the soil. And so people add things like Redmond sea salt and get a lot of, like, that's why cows have salt licks, things like that. But I'm wondering how much comes off of the ocean minerals oh, yeah. that just immediately plants straight into the grass, the, the cattle eat it. Cause I mean, it, yeah, the, the photos and videos you sent of, of the, the lushness look like basically Hawaii. Yeah. And these animals are just chowing down. On sugar yeah. green grass. And we've, t I mean, we can get into sourcing stuff in a little bit about US versus Australia and supply chain and all this type of stuff. But I think that there's a negative stigma on New Zealand and Australia from a grazing thing. Cause I think people just want everything American made, but I think that's far more complex than that. Um, but to get back on track, <laughs> there's a lot of things that should be in food, a lot of things that shouldn't be in food. No one talks about it. No one's thinking about this when they're making a product. And this is the, I think the, the core thing that has been driving me forward over this like two plus year journey to get this out is how can we start making alternatives for what people are reaching for, for convenience with a thoughtful manner of what is in here, what is not in here and making sure. 